Okay, so without further ado, uh, the first talk is uh, invited talk by Chitska Starkenberg from Northwestern Sierra, uh, uncovering the details of galaxy formation and stellar halos of Roman. Thank you. Is the mic working? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, my name is Chitska Starkenberg and I'm at Northwestern University and I'm very happy to be here uh, to tell you a little bit about galaxy formation stellar halos and how Roman can help us um, learn more about these, distinguish between our theories and uh, understand more physics. And so because this is a Roman cross theory meeting, I'm focusing mostly on the theory side. Um, and instead of giving you a very broad overview of like the whole of galaxy formation and evolution, I'm going to give you a few examples uh, where Roman will be able to give us answers that we have had trouble getting to before. And But to start off, I'd like to talk a little bit about galaxy evolution. And um, in general, people often think about this as you have the large scale structure of the universe in which uh, dark matter contracts and forms halos. Uh, in those halos, you have galaxies forming, but there's a lot more happening. There's other structures. Um, there are galaxies merging. There are satellites around others. There's a cosmic web, so there's relations between the galaxy, the halos, and the galaxies. So this is often thought of the external part. And then on the internal part, you have how actually the gas accretion, cooling and heating, inflows and outflows work within the halo of a galaxy. How the star formation, stellar evolution and feedback determine what the stellar populations are in the galaxy, how stellar winds and supernova change the ISM and push outflows. How all the small scale physics and chemical processes involving gas, dust, and radiation change the chemical composition and distribute that. How supermassive black hole formation, feeding and feedback changes the galaxy and changes the appearance of the galaxy. And how secondary internal dynamical processes, such as the formation of disks and bars and spiral arms and bulges, can change the physics and appearance of the galaxy itself. And so I would say those are often thought of as the internal part of galaxies. Oh, I have a nice pointer. I should use it. Um, but these are very correlated. And we have some examples from uh, the beautiful work that's been done over the past decades. We have some very nice examples uh, very nearby. Oh, haha. Of course, not to forget a quenching of star formation can affect the whole galaxy locally and globally. And so if we look uh, in our own neighborhood, for example, in our own Milky Way, which is on this side, recent work has found, or there've been, there have been multiple works. Uh, I just wanna highlight one where the um, recovered star formation history of the, of the Milky Way disk shows some peaks that seem to coincide with, for example, the orbital pericenter passage of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. So that suggests that the external and internal processes are very related. Uh, a similar thing, have, people have argued seeing a similar thing in M31, um, where M31's massive, relatively metal-rich stellar halo the giant stellar stream that is seen in the M31 halo, the rotation in the inner part, and the compact metal-rich satellite M32, and a global burst of star formation could all be explained by an interaction between M32 and M31 about two billion years ago. And this has all been possible by the work of doing a very, very deep observations of both the stellar populations in the galaxies themselves and the stellar halo. So the whole, 
the whole system. And uh, with Roman, this might be possible for multiple for other galaxies beyond this very local group pair. So to take you a step back, why study stellar halos? And just so you know, this is the stellar halo of uh, M31, in which you can see pretty clearly the giant stellar stream that I just mentioned. Stellar halos provide us clue, clues to the galaxy's past evolution and provide insights in actually low mass galaxy formation because the smaller systems fall in, they get ripped apart, they get disturbed and, and form this stellar halo. All the structures that we find in these outskirts of galaxies are great tracers of the dark matter halo. Uh, and this holds for globular clusters and, and satellites, so smaller dwarf galaxies outside of the galaxy, but also of the streams and the shells uh, on all these disturbed tidal debris that we see. And again, in the Milky Way, especially uh, with the start of SDSS and especially with Gaia more recently, we found many, many stellar streams. And I think we're getting close to 100 stellar streams, known stellar streams in the Milky Way stellar halo. And another thing that we study uh, in the environment of the Milky Way and uh, mostly in Andromeda, what is very challenging to get for any galaxies beyond is looking at the faintest dwarf galaxies uh, that are around. And so these are two recently found dwarf galaxies, Leo M and Leo K, and they look beautiful, right? And so we need to find these for more systems to be able to understand what the how these very faint systems look like. What, how does it depend on the environment? We only know them very, very close by. And we've learned so much from them about dark matter, about galaxy formation, and even about the very, very early universe, because these systems are very, very old and very, very metal poor. And so their stars can tell us a lot about their own uh, formation. So there's been uh, so an, a lot of efforts in trying to get to these, uh, observing these satellites and stellar streams in the nearby universe beyond the local group, uh, but it's very hard work. And this whole low, uh, this whole field is a low surface brightness discovery space for Euclid and Rubin, but especially for Roman. And so, if we think about the theory, it's like how do we do predictions, how we're going to test these predictions, there is actually a, a large spectrum of theoretical predictions, a large spectrum of simulations and modeling that can make some predictions. And all of these have their pros and they have their cons. And what you may think about first is large, oh, here, large cosmological simulations that have a large number of galaxies, but you can only run one of them and your resolution might be limited. But you can use this to study the low surface brightness, uh, statistics of low surface brightness galaxies. You can study this to look at clusters and larger structures. You can do higher resolution simulations of individual Milky Way-like systems or similar and there get a high resolution uh, where you can try to forward model this into observational space. And I'll come back to that later. Um, and you can uh, go into directions that can explore the input physics more. And I will talk about those mostly because there we can try out with different physics, see what the observations are like, and therefore uh, see what the, what the observations could actually constrain on the theoretical side. So let me go uh, into that. I'll start briefly with the large scale structure. So this is, these are um, synthetic observations for Euclid. Uh, no, sorry, for Rubin. 
there's too much. Um, um, which will observe a lot of these at a larger scale in integrated light. And people have been working uh, to, based on these, to, do, uh, to classify tidal features and to do a lot of uh, characterization of what all of these uh, instruments will see. But the interpretation of this, it's like what does it mean for our theories is still very challenging. So let me talk about changing the physics. So in this example, uh, we took uh, one galaxy and changed the initial, the dark matter initial conditions in the early, early universe very, very slightly so that the system at the end had the same mass, but it had a slightly different formation history. In addition to that, we coupled this with star formation histories from empirical galaxy formation model so that we separate out the hierarchical uh, galaxy formation from dark matter structures and merger trees and the star formation history uh, that are governed by the empirical model. And we can change them at, uh, separately from each other. And then we did a particle tagging technique to look at the stellar halos that are formed in the end. And so to give you just a punchline, if we look at the total mass in the stellar halo that we find for Milky Way like galaxies, we find that we're just slightly changing the accretion history, slightly changing when major mergers happen and how big they are. We can cover the whole range of observed stellar halo data. And so the, the, the diversity, the spread uh, is very big. The second thing we did is we changed the stellar to halo mass relation, which is how much stars do you assume a galaxy can make in a dark matter halo, uh, which is a very uncertain quantity at the low mass end. And uh, so we varied that and saw what that did to our set of uh, stellar halo predictions. And then if we looked at the total mass that is in the stellar halo for three different slopes, you see that the normalization increases and actually the scatter decreases. And so looking at these stellar halos gives, gives us a sense on the stellar mass that is, that is in the lowest mass systems. Uh, to get a larger st a statistical sample of predictions, a larger statistical sample of galaxies and uh, run many, many examples uh, to get stati statistical predictions and being able to infer from st uh, statistical observations, Another example focuses on semi-analytic modeling. And in this case, we used uh, accretion histories based on a galaxy formation uh, semi-analytic model. And we sampled the infalling orbits of satellite galaxies and in integrate those in an evolving, growing halo over cosmological time and predict the evolving substructure in that. And what I mean with that is that things could, dwarf galaxies could fall in as satellites, then at some point they could be stripped apart and form a stellar stream. At some point that stream may actually uh, start forming shells within the stream, or it could be completely disrupted and face mixed where it's not observable as a coherent structure anymore, but builds up to the whole stellar halo. And we can make this an arbitrary large sample size so that we can provide robust predictions and test the effects of changing the physics uh, on the outcome. And so our prediction is that nearby galaxies will have uh, stellar streams and will have actually multiple stellar streams that would be available. So these plots show you the surface brightness limits and the fraction of galaxies 
that has a certain number of observable tidal features. Um, and so you can see the Roman age band does quite a bit better than R or visible. Um, and actually at some of the expected limits, about half of, in this case, in this case, LMC size systems should have at least one, and some will have multiple uh, observable features or stellar streams or shells. Um, and then to show you how, what, what happens if we change the physics. So what happens if we, uh, in this case, also change the stellar mass halo mass relation at the low mass end, and we say very few dwarf galaxies could could have a lot of stellar mass, then you see a totally different distribution. So having a statistical observational sample of this is really informative for actually getting to the physics. And for that, we need more than the, the, the numbers that we get in the Milky Way, because we need to sample over the um, merger history, the, the accretion history, the formation history of galaxies. Uh, and their environments. So lastly, I wanted to say something about uh, doing uh, detailed dynamical modeling in small isolated uh, simulations where you get very, very high resolution and you can model the orbits of indiv almost individual stars, uh, but you do just one system at a time. And so in this case, uh, we took the PANDA survey of the stellar halo of Andromeda and took just one small uh, box out of that. And we inserted three stellar streams, three artificial stellar streams in this data. You might be able to see it. One is the same mass as a specific stellar stream in the Milky Way. There's one that's five times more massive, and there's one that's 10 times more massive. And you, most people see maybe two, one, maybe two. So what we did then is we fitted isochrons to the PANDAS data and forward modeled it to what Roman would be able to see, including a Milky Way foreground and the M31 stellar halo background and the streams. And then you see this. So we said that the Roman, Roman would be able to resolve most streams, even the low mass ones. And this is actually true beyond uh, M31, and it should be true out to about 3.5 megaparsec, depending a little bit on where the stream lives. Um, now, in... Uh, for some stellar streams in the Milky Way, there have actually been detections of substructure within the stream. And most noted, most well-known are gaps, where there's under densities in the stars in the stream. And one thing that could cause these is, is uh, interactions with small dark matter halos. So this is an interesting avenue to be able to constrain dark matter. But there's also other things that could cause this. For example, interactions with uh, molecular clouds, uh, resonances with the Milky Way bar or the Milky Way spiral arms. And so what we need is statistics. We need a statistical sample across different galaxies uh, to really see, do we see gaps in other systems? Do we see gaps in systems that don't have a bar? Do we see gaps in all cases? And if we have a statistical sample, what can it tell us? And so we took the same data or the same approach and actually introduced a, a, an interaction with the dark matter halo that grew a gap in the stream uh, in the same simulation. And then again, asked the question, can you detect the gap? And what we come out with both relying on visual inspection and on uh, a gap finding, specific gap finding algorithm, is that you'd likely be able to detect gaps out to two megaparsecs.
So some additional things that I won't cover in more detail um, is uh, work on a tool for predicting the re resolved stellar population observations. Uh, so uh, resolved stars and the density taking into account the crowding for stellar halo applications. Um, the Hof stream spotter, which is a stream finder specifically targeted for external galaxies. So what would come out, what we cannot do now yet, almost cannot do yet now, but should be able to do in the future. And, uh, and complete a uh, more complete modeling of actually globular cluster stream formation, uh, which is a work in progress, where we go all the way from uh, galaxy evolution and initial properties of star clusters at early times, a very careful evolution of the star clusters and the formation of the stellar streams and uh, the modeling of them to Roman observables. But all of this, uh, or most of the people involved in this, are a part of this larger team, uh, which is RINGS, uh, which is uh, gathered a lot of people interested in stellar halos, dwarf galaxies, and resolved stars in the nearby universe, um, and has been working very hard in providing tools to be able to make synthetic images, um, to make mock data, and, and use that to develop the analysis tools to be able to work with the data once it will be there. Um, and so to give you another example, what would be possible for stellar halo work with the Roman is in this case for the nearby galaxy Sané, where uh, the advantage is that if you look in the infrared, you look through the dust in the galaxy itself, but in the halo, you cover with one pointing a large fraction of the stellar halo, which is what nothing, no other instrument could do. And you can do both targeted observations um, of streams of, and dwarf galaxies in the stellar halo, get their metallicity age, precise luminosity and structure, um, or for about 45 pointings, do a full halo mapping that could resolve the complete satellite luminosity function of Sene down to a, magni a V magnitude of minus four. And I would also like to point to the poster that I got introduced yesterday by Catherine Wynn, who's uh, showing new results on synthetic images for dwarf galaxies. Uh, so another uh, approach um, within the rings teams team is to adapt the uh, Ananke pipeline into Pi Ananke, um, which is another forward modeling pipeline uh, that has been successfully used for Gaia for multiple data releases now, um, and is now developed for Roman. Um, and uh, Adrian will be talking about this in, I think, two talks from now. Yeah. And so that is actually the missing piece that I was hadn't talked about yet. And using high resolution simulations of individual galaxies and then doing a very careful forward modeling to synthetic data. So, I actually come to, uh, to my takeaway points. Stellar halos provide a wealth of information about both their host galaxy and about the lower mass structures that you find in that stellar halo and how they have formed. And with that, they provide us an, another view actually on the early universe and cosmology and uh, hierarchical galaxy evolution and structure formation in the universe. In many galaxies in Roman, in the Roman surveys will have observable satellites and tidal features, uh, which would provide us amazing data, but also statistics, which we really need to be able to constrain theory. Um, globular cluster stellar streams are very thin. They're currently not observable in external galaxies, but they will be observable in the nearby universe with Roman. And even the gaps in those streams should be able 
should be resolved. But we need more theoretical work to help interpret all the data that will come out and actually know how to properly compare our theories with the observational data set. And uh, synthetic data, producing synthetic data can help to develop and optimize the analysis tools to be ready when the data will be there. And I would like to leave you with this spectrum of theoretical predictions. I think we need all of these. They all have uh, their good points. They also all have bad points. They also they all have downsides. Um, but I think we need to combine the information that we can get from all of these to actually interpret the data. Thank you. Thank you, Chitska, for the nice talk. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, we also would encourage the junior people in the audience to ask their questions too if they have any. So don't be shy. <laughs> I was very interested in the, the possibility of detecting dark matter in the gaps of the stellar stream. So there is a reason why you expect to be just concentration of dark matter or Perhaps with Roman observing, like in K, perhaps you can find some dust emission in these gaps. And that's a good question. Um, should I repeat the question for online? No, okay, we'll pick it up. Okay. Uh, so um, I think that's um, it's not that likely uh, because this is far out in the stellar halo, and the stellar populations are very very old. The stellar streams are made up of satellite galaxies that formed very, very, or global clusters that formed very, very early on. They're really out in the halo. All their gas has been stripped away, and actually the stars have been stripped, which is why it is a very thin stream. So it's unlikely that there is really a lot of dust there. Um, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, our team is developing an alternative pipeline, which is uh, optimized for low surface brightness uh, uh, observations for Roman. So uh, this is work led by uh, Alex Borlov at uh, Ames, NASA Ames, and uh, so this will be excellent for the uh, unresolved uh, stellar stream uh, detections. Yes, and I think I had a reference to that in the uh on on this side of the figure but yes no i'm not saying this is the only work that's been done uh and i it's really hard to be <laughs> like and and um i don't make any claim to being complete uh and there's a lot of important work to be done uh, and being done and uh in the larger on the larger scales, a lot of these low surface brightness features are also tidal tails of merging galaxies and uh, and also intercluster light, which I don't have time to talk about as well. Yeah. Earlier in your talk, you had said that you, with slight changes to the the merger history, you were able to reproduce the entire range of, is that, would you consider that encouraging or discouraging <laughs> for the statistic? Because what are you gonna make of that when you get many more, will you be able to disentangle it or is it just gonna be so dependent on a tiny little change that? That's a very good question. Um... It, I think it's it's both. It's discouraging that there's no like very clear signal, um, but it's also it's it's encouraging encouraging in the way that we do recover the full range 
of observations. But with the, the changes that we've made, it's not so, are, we're not so big. So then the question is, how are you going to disentangle between that? So yeah, I think it's, it's both. But, oh, sorry. If we, sorry, if I can add, there is what we found is that there is actually information in the size in the in the size of the scatter. So if we change the star formation pro, uh, form, formalism, then the size of the scatter increased or decreased. So it doesn't have to be smooth and. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Okay, I think we should move on to the next talk. So uh, thank you, Chitska. And we also have the Slack. So if you have any questions, you can post them there or find the speakers during the coffee break. <laughs>